Thank you, Jean Lu, and it's a pleasure to be here. Congratulations on the organization of a, a, a great program. Um, my topic, as you've probably seen, is the management of big games. Uh, I have submitted a paper which, being written by a lawyer, is far too long for the, the time that uh, is available for presentation, so you can uh, read it in due course. But start with the, the accepting the proposition that the Olympic Games are now big games. Uh, that was not always so, <clears throat> and there are many reasons uh, why that was not so, and also many reasons why there's been an evolution in uh, in the size of the uh, the games. And I think uh, those of you who have an academic bent uh, might find it a very interesting topic for analysis. How did the program get from where it was in 1960 to where it is today, and what's going to be the impact, <clears throat> if any, on uh, changing from a sport-based program to an event-based program. Uh, in my view, that gives us a lot of flexibility, and there are probably some suggestions anybody who's familiar with the Olympic program and the various, and the various sports, disciplines, and events uh, could have some pretty good suggestions. Um, there are, as you can imagine, some very special management problems um, for big games, and particularly big international games. And my uh, purpose today is to talk about management, not about the philosophy, not so much about how we got there, but uh, uh, sort of the, the many changes that have led to um, implications of, uh, well, many of the biggest changes result, uh, I think, from the, uh, the growth of television, uh, the, the quality of it, the uh, the, the way in which the games can be <clears throat> made real and, and, and emotional to audiences, and of course the revenues that were uh, that have derived from that. Uh, the um, the changes um, go to uh, the the audience size. Uh, what used to be a fairly restricted audience is now measured in billions of people who can see. Uh, the games almost uh, instantly. Um, it, that has a, an impact on uh, how the revenues are shared, uh, what, what should be the division of those revenues, and, and should that division change uh, now that we've uh, moved into a different era of producing the television at the level of the IOC itself, and I'll talk about that. Uh, the bigger the money is, <clears throat> the more discussions there are about how it should be shared. And one of the things we've done, uh, as you probably know, is basically divide the, that portion of the television revenues that doesn't go to the organizing committees uh, into uh, three parts. The sports federations get one third, the, the National Olympic Committees through Olympic Solidarity get a third, and the IOC uh, gets uh, approximately a third. One of the uh, resulting problems is how do you share? How do the international federations share? And they come to us and say, uh, athletics is really important. We should get more than field hockey. Uh, one of the ways that we've learned how to survive is to say, well, look, uh, this is actually a sport problem. Here's how much you've got for the international federations. You decide. And so you keep them happy on the, uh, the, the total that's, that's always increasing and let them worry about who should get what portion of it. And the same is, is largely true with the National Olympic Committee share, which is we, we do that on a continental uh, basis with the, the regional associations of NOCs. We've also uh, moved to take control of the, the negotiations for television. Uh, it used to be, as, as television came on stream, uh, the IOC was really worried about possible liability if it made any promises with any broadcasters and so on. So they, if you can believe it, uh, left that to the organizing committees and simply uh, asserted the right to approve all of the contracts but didn't actually do the negotiations. And that didn't uh, change until uh, Samaranch uh, came into office in 1980. And, and he sort of looked at it and said, this is, this is our biggest window on the world. This is, this is how 
99.9% of the people who participate or who watch the games uh, absorb them. 1% may sit, they, you know, sit in a seat and pay a ticket for it. Uh, so it's very important to us that that, that that be done properly and that the largest possible audiences can watch it. Uh, and it's also starting to become financially more important. Why on earth would we leave this responsibility for negotiating the contracts with an organizing committee that comes into existence, disappears the day after the games close, uh, they'll make their deals without any interest in, in the residual impact uh, on the, uh, the, the television. So we had to, uh, we had to talk our way into that room with huge uh, resistance from the uh, organizing committees who, who those of you who've been involved with an organizing committee know that they think the television rights are theirs. They're our games, they're our television rights, and anything that the IOC gets is they're stealing our money. And so that was the, 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 the status quo ante. What we did uh, starting with the, the, the calendar year was 1983, uh, the games involved were 1988. And we said, all right, starting now, we're going to do these negotiations jointly. Screams and yells, you can't imagine the noise. Um, but it was a step. Uh, Sam Ranch was very practical, and he said, we can't do it all at once. We'll do it step by step. So with Calgary and Seoul, it was joint. The problem with that was, while we were at the table, if we didn't agree with the organizing committees or vice versa, we were stymied. And I can tell you, the, the first, time I, uh, first time I got involved in this was a phone call from Sam Ranch who said, uh, uh, Leeson Deek, I'm a Deek, um, you're now the chairman of our television negotiations committee. I said, but I don't know anything about television. Well, he said, well, none of us do. We just got to learn it. So <clears throat> we started off, and, and, and it, was, it happened to be Calgary. Calgary is advised by a, a, the Mark McCormick organization, a very well-known television, particularly sports television organization. And they had this anal retentive view of Olympic television rights, which is the longer you waited, the more valuable they became. And we're saying, well, uh, okay, but uh, you know, you, you're, you're negotiating on the basis that Miracle on Ice, you know, the, U.S. winning the hockey in 1980 is going to happen again? It's not. It's not. The, the United States is going to have a very bad Olympics in Sarajevo. And so we think we should negotiate before the games because the networks don't yet know <laughs> what's going to happen to the U.S. team. No, no, they said our, our people tell us it's uh, to, to wait. They said, well, how much are your people saying you're going to get? And they said, well, at least $208 million which is about three times what it had ever been. <clears throat> in Paso, he said, well, all right. Uh, if you guarantee us our share of $208 million, you can have the negotiations whenever you want. Oh, well, we can't do that because we're an organizing committee. We can't guarantee. They said, folks, one way or the other, either you guarantee us what your people say you're going to get, and if you're that confident in their, their uh, estimate, there's nothing to it. If you're not prepared to do that, then you have to take our advice and negotiate now. So there's a lot of rug scuffing and rumbling about the IOC. But they finally said, all right, okay, you win. You're a rotten bunch of people, but we can't afford not to agree with you. So we had the negotiations about a month or so before Sarajevo, and, and the outcome of those negotiations was $309 million which point the grumbling died down quite a bit. And the games were terrible for the United States. If we'd had the, uh, the negotiations after that, um, I'd be surprised if we'd, we'd have got half of what we ended up uh, getting. So that was step one. Step two was for Barcelona in 92. <clears throat> and there we negotiated the rights in consultation with the organizing committees. We negotiated them in consultation with. Now, you can't run roughshod over your uh, organizing committees, but 
it was certainly a lot better in, in terms of coming to closure and, and, and getting rid of a whole bunch of really goofy ideas that Barcelona thought was good. They, were, they wanted to, to do a profit sharing deal with ABC, which had just lost a fortune in, in Calgary. And there was no, not, not a single hard dollar in it. it was whatever the profit was, uh, we'd share it. And they thought that was a great idea. We didn't. So we got uh, 400 and some odd plus uh, uh, a cable deal that was very uh, effective. And then finally for Atlanta and, and beyond, we negotiated and told the organizing committees what, we would, what they would get, uh, which was roughly half of the, uh, the rights. And from then on, that's the way we've done it. The, the big change in recent years is, you know, if you're moving the games around, which is our semi-philosophy, uh, sooner or later you're going to give them to a country that does not have a broadcasting structure and, and the capacity to produce coverage of the games uh, that's at the level that Olympi Olympic audiences are now expecting. <clears throat> so we said, you know, we're selling these rights for billions of dollars. We better do something to make sure they're worth billions of dollars. So we'll produce the games. And we, that led to the, the formation of what's called Olympic Broadcasting Services, of which your humble servant is the, the chairman at the, uh, at the moment. And we've, it started off, we, we sort of ran a parallel thing with, with Beijing. Beijing produced the, uh, the, what they called the basic signal. But starting in Vancouver in 2010, Olympic Broadcasting Services produced the games coverage. So we've gone Vancouver, gone London, Sochi, and now we're wrestling with uh, Brazil. And believe me, that's like being in a sumo match when you weigh 100 pounds and the big sumo wrestler weighs 400. Anyway, we'll get it done, but it, it certainly would have been a nightmare uh, had Brazil been responsible for producing the, uh, the coverage. And one of the things we can do now with the, the technology is we can do so much of the, the coverage that, that uh, if you're an NBC, which is a very picky thing, or a BBC, um, our coverage is so good that basically they can rely on it. So if they're covering a, a swimming meet or a basketball game, our coverage of that game is everything they need and they can focus their attention only on the American players that they want to cover or whatever it may be. Saves them a fortune. Uh, the, the interfaces now that we've developed for them are such that you can actually do your editing, post-production, even your commentating, if you're in NBC, from New York. So you don't have to send uh, the 1,500 people that you used to send to, the, to do the games. And we can do the beauty shots and we can do the summaries and so on, all of which reduces the costs to the broadcasters and increases the quality of the, the work that they're going to get. And that's, that's, there are two elements to that. One is the, the service to the broadcasters and to the, the viewing public. The other is, of course, that, that for every dollar they save on production costs, it's available for rights fees. Uh, so it, it works uh, pretty well for, for both of us. Anyway, the, ma the management challenges are, um, are, are many and varied. Um, one is, is your product. You know, what, what, there's something for the IOC, that, of a, it's like a franchise, like a commercial franchise. And we're the franchisor. We've got franchisees that are the various organizing committees. And we want, it's like a McDonald's thing, there are certain things we want in terms of the look of the games, the level of coverage, uh, ticketing, accreditation, uh, hospitality for sponsors and so on. And we have a fair amount of experience with it. So we can, we're in a position to share it and say these are, these are the things we need. Uh, the local flavor will, will be yours, uh, depending on where the games are, uh, they will be different. But there are certain common elements that we need to have. And that's part of what, uh, what we do with, our, uh, um, with the various organizing committees to make sure that they're happy that, you know, Beijing w was happy that they had sort of Chinese uh, flavored games. And, and we were happy that all of the things that 
needed to be part of the, uh, the games were, were there. Uh, in recent years, um, very recent, in fact, uh, as of de December of last year, we've done about a, somewhere between a 90 and 120 degree change in our approach to the uh, candidate cities. Uh, part of that was a result of a, a shortage of uh, candidates for the 2022 Winter Games. Um, and, and I think part, <clears throat> part of the reason for that shortage is that we didn't pay enough attention to the first story that came out saying that the Sochi Games cost $52 billion or whatever the number was. The minute that hit the ground, we should have been out there saying, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. That's not what the Games cost. The games or the costs were actually within the norms that, that we expect. What those costs resulted from was building two separate cities, one in the mountains with all of the infrastructure that you need to have a ski resort, which is a billion, billions of dollars, and the other was a, a complete sports center and small city down at the, the level of the Black Sea for the, the ice sports. And we fumbled that. So the result is all sorts of politicians and opposition groups in cities that were thinking of bidding for the games suddenly said, we can't afford $52 billion. And they didn't pick up fast enough on that that's not what it cost. Uh, I would think there are some people in, let me just say Scandinavia today, that must be kicking themselves around the blocks uh, because they let their politicians get hold of this $52 billion dollar figure and, and just shake it like a, a dog with a bone, uh, especially Norway, who, who put on the Lillehammer Games 20 years ago. They know perfectly well it doesn't cost anything like that. However, uh, they're going to pay the price of uh, that. So what we've done now is say, all right, instead of having candidate cities bid against a, a fixed set of criteria with no particular help, just here's what we want, what's your bid? We now say, well, let's talk. Let's talk. Tell us what your ideas are, how these games can be made to work in the best possible way for your country, for legacy and minimized costs and so forth. And we'll help. We can tell you what's happened in other cities. We can tell you what uh, the, the problems are. And, and let's see if we can't get a solution that makes sense for you and for us. And there, there will be times, uh, I'm sure, when we say, look, it's a great idea, but it's not going to work for the Olympics. Um, you know, in which, or, or say, it's a great idea for some day, but why don't you go back and work on it and, and maybe not bid for this set of games? Uh, I mean, one of our problems with this approach is likely to be that if we attract 12 cities and we talk to them all and, and, and agree that it, their bids are feasible, then it's hard to eliminate them on a preliminary stage. So you could end up with a, you know, a 12 the 12-city uh, final vote, which will be chaos, as, as anybody who's followed these things uh, through. But it does mean that we can we can avoid uh, the likelihood of white elephants and, and, and facilities that are too big for uh, an after-use. And we've had examples in the past where, where the after-use has, has been anticipated in, in advance. Uh, one was Alberville. Uh, for the, the Winter Games in 1992. Uh, they said, look, we know we have to have a stadium for 40,000 people for the opening and closing ceremonies, but we'll never use, we don't need it. In fact, we don't even need a stadium, but we certainly don't need a 40,000 seat stadium. So he said, why don't you do a temporary one? Build it up, have the games uh, there, and take it down. It'll cost you probably 60% of what a permanent facility would of cost you, and you'll have no maintenance costs. Future. So they thought it was a great idea. For those of you that saw it, Atlanta, uh, Atlanta did not need another track and field stadium. They did need a new baseball stadium. So if you've ever seen pictures of, of uh, Atlanta, the the poobah seats and the boxes and you know sky boxes and whatever you call them are, are actually on one of the corners of the of the track. Uh, which people thought was a bit odd until, you know, when everyone left town for the Olympics, pew, down came the, uh, out went the track and, and the baseball stadium was built around that. So that, they ended up with something they needed and did not end up with something that they, uh, they didn't need. 
About a dozen years ago, um, I chaired a commission uh, called, imaginatively, Commission for the Study of the Olympic Games. And the idea was to say, look, how can we help? How can we identify and, and then help organizing committees? Things that cost too much and things that are, are unnecessarily complex in the organization of the games. And it, our, our report was approved uh, in, in 2003 and had suggestions that would save tens, hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars on, on the organization of the games. Uh, part of which was the result of, of organizing committees thinking in silos. You had ticketing, you had the Olympic Village, you had accreditation, you had hospitality and all these things. They never spoke to each other. So we got into a, we got into a state at one point where at some meeting of, of National Olympic Committees, one of the delegates from uh, a small, uh, I, I forget what part of the world, came and said, listen, we don't have enough money to go on one of these tours and, and come to the United States and practice for a week or 10 days before the games. Why don't you just open the village 10 days early? Oh, you say, well, what a great idea. That's we can do lots of things. And so that was decided. And nobody thought what the knock-on effects would be. You've got to ramp up the village. You've got to ramp up the media center because there'll be media coming. You've got to put the security system in place. So we figured, the, 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 I think it was a week, not 10 days, that being as conservative as possible, that's probably $10 million a day to have the whole, and the transportation system and so on. Somebody just added $70 million to the cost of the Olympics because nobody, nobody said, hold it, hold it. You've got to think about what this means. So we said part of you, what you need to do is to, is to have uh, an integrated uh, approach to the games. And that led following uh, Atlanta, or, or after Atlanta was designated as the, the host for 96, to the first creation of what, what we now call the coordination commission. Uh, up until that point, every organizing committee dealt with a, a delegation from the National Olympic Committees, delegation from the international federations and, and so on, multiplied the, the, the cost and drains on the organizing committees uh, and encouraged the silo effect. So for the first time, we said, no, we'll, we'll put all of these commissions together. We'll have IF representatives, NOC representatives, athlete representatives, and some experts, and, and IOC. And, and so I uh, was, that was our first time, and I chaired that because I guess I was in North America on the same time zone as, as Atlanta. <clears throat> and it was more effective than the, the previous uh, trifurcated approach. Uh, our difficulty was that because it was the first time we'd done it, uh, the Coordination Commission didn't have the, the power to say to the organizing committee, this is what you have to do. We could suggest. And I don't know how many of you have been to Atlanta. They are very suggestion resistant. Uh, and, and certainly from any organization that has anybody from Europe on it. So we didn't have uh, as much of an impact as I hoped we would, but my report to the IOC afterwards says, Let's, the next time you've got to give the, the Coordination Commission power to, to say you, you have to do these things. And if there's a lot of resistance, um, the executive board can decide it. And so that's what we have now uh, in, in place. And I think they're far more effective. Uh, we're probably too polite uh, with the organizing committees. And, and they know that because other people who worked on previous organizing committees say, if you hold the line long enough, they'll give up. And uh, I think we need to, uh, we'll need to fix that in, in uh, due course. Um, as to managing the competitions, uh, we're lucky in a sense that um, the, the international federations are familiar with their own sports on, on a one-by-one -one basis, so they can, they can do that pretty well. We just have to make sure that they don't insist on facilities that are too big. I mean, you know, basketball would like a, a 15,000 seat stadium that, that might be filled for the final of uh, the basketball tournament, but never again in the history of the, of the thing. So you've got to uh, keep those down. 
the IFs determine the, the qualifications, uh, whether it's in, in pre-Olympic tournaments or minimum standards and, and so forth, uh, which is good. And uh, there's a, I guess if there's a, a real problem for us, it's the, the constantly expanding number of athletes. And, and each year we draw this firm line in the sand saying the maximum number will be X and then the next wave comes in and that line in the sand disappears and so the high water mark is, is even greater. So what the impact will be of our new event-based uh, system, uh, it's hard to tell thus far. Um, we've got a, we have this provision in the Olympic Charter that says after every games, we do an evaluation uh, as to what the program ought to be. And uh, we, the only time we really did it um, sort of sport by sport was after the Athens games. And the, the, the outcome of that was that baseball and softball got eliminated. And I think part of that reason was that uh, everyone was mad at baseball because the major leagues were not uh, sending us their best players they had a, a zero to ineffective uh, anti-doping program and and uh, so it wasn't wasn't surprising that baseball got eliminated it was surprising and disappointing that the women's softball uh, got because we were getting the best players and they did have a very good uh, anti-doping program and, and we've been trying to build up the the percentage of women uh, on the field of play and i think it was that, that a lot of our members from around the world thought that softball was women's baseball and got caught up in that. Uh, managing the Olympic revenues. This is a big, uh, an ongoing uh, concern uh, because as the games get larger and become uh, uh, more complex, it's increasingly important to manage the, the, the uh, financial resources. Uh, one of the problems we have is, is that uh, we're really not in a position to control what a host country wants to do as part of the Olympic project. Uh, we, we're constantly at them say, don't build something you don't need and don't build something that's too big. But given that, uh, you know, in London has been trying since the end of World War II to figure out what to do with its East End, which had just become a wasteland. And part of their plan for the Olympics was not only to have the, the sports facilities in place, but to redo the whole East End. Hundreds of billions of, or millions of, of pounds of, of infrastructure work. It was a, it's a great legacy. But you just gotta be careful that that doesn't uh, get out of control. And, and we're not really in a position to control what they wanna do in the, uh, uh, with their things. Uh, the television revenues, uh, as you know, uh, as I mentioned, they're, they're, we negotiate them now ourselves and we split them. Uh, I would say that you know, I talk about television revenues, that kind of d dates me because the, 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 the number of platforms uh, for delivery of uh, the audiovisual stuff is, uh, uh, is huge. I mean, we've got the classic free-to-air television that uh, a lot of people use. Uh, but we've got cable, we've got uh, mobile, we've got handheld devices that now are uh, being uh, included in that. I remember when I was heading up the uh, television negotiation, we had a, an international seminar in 1987, this going back a bit, and uh, we talked about the possibility of Olympic television being on cable, as well as free to air. Well, the networks just, uh, they, the world, as we know it, would end if Olympics were ever on cable. Within three years, NBC had a cable package for, for uh, Barcelona, and, and it's now absolutely routine. And, and in fact, the more of this you have, the better. You know, a, a full saturation, 24-hour-a-day coverage for the 16-day period would produce, you know, between you, you know, taking out news and recaps and summaries, yeah, three or four maybe 500 hours of coverage for a, a summer games. There are 3,000 hours of, of events and competition, uh, most of which would never be seen if you didn't have cable and you didn't have uh, some of the other 
stuff. So it, that's been a, a, a big uh, a progress for us. Uh, the next important uh, revenue is our sponsorship. We got into the sponsorship business, if you like, uh, partly as a way of trying to balance our almost total reliance on uh, television revenues. I mean, our model, economic model, would have made your hair stand on end. 95% uh, of our revenues came from television, a single source. And of that, somewhere in the order of 85% came from a single country, the United States, which, when I got involved with this, had just finished trying to ruin the Olympic movement over the, the Moscow boycott. So we said, all right, we've got, to, we've got to find some other source and settled on sponsorship. And uh, that evolved uh, fairly quickly. Uh, I got another call, Deke. So you're now chairman of the marketing commission. I said, we don't even have a marketing commission. What are you talking about? He says, we have a marketing commission and you're the chairman. I said, well, I don't know anything about marketing or sponsorship, nor do we get out there and learn. So we, uh, we actually ended up in a pretty good place with it. Uh, we developed what's called the top program, which all, all that means is the Olympic program, whereby we re we're trying to respond to a, a complaint from some of our major sponsors saying, you know, we love the Olympics as, as a marketing property. They call them all properties. It's wonderful, but you're too hard to do business with. Not the thing you ever want to hear from a customer sponsor. So he said, what, what's the problem? He said, well, if we want to be a worldwide sponsor of the Calgary Games, we have to make a deal with the Calgary Olympic Committee. Uh, we've got to make a deal with the uh, Canadian Olympic Committee. And in every country in which we want to activate the sponsorship, we have to reach an agreement with the National Olympic Committee. Uh, some of, almost all of which have an exaggerated idea of how much uh, their territory is worth. And frankly, it's just not worth it. So we went into a huddle and came back with the idea of, what, of the top program and say, what if we could put all of the rights into a single package? Organizing committee, the National Olympic Committees, and the IOC. And you can do a one-stop shopping. They thought that would be wonderful. And we said, what if we also uh, were able to guarantee total exclusivity for you in your product or service category. Hmm. They would thought they'd died and gone to heaven. And so we started off. Um, the, the 1988 games were the first ones. It were startup problems because some of the, the deals had already been made, but by and large, uh, that's the way it is. It, it still continues today. Uh, it's it's uh, north of a billion dollars per quad uh, in, in U.S. dollars. Our big problem was, uh, there were two big problems. One was it was a marketing program. And so what the sponsors were interested in were markets. They didn't care, for example, this is before in the, the, the pre-BRIC days. They didn't care about Russia, even though Russia was a very powerful uh, sport country, because its market was worth nothing. Same, believe it or not, for China. And we had, to, we had a lot of trouble explaining to them, <clears throat> look, sorry, this is not uh, any comment on your sporting importance, but it's, it's a marketing uh, program, and that's what you have to deal with. Uh, and that's, that changes. And so what we do is we make a deal with every National Olympic Committee in, this, in the soft drink category. It's actually non-alcoholic beverages now. And we hammer out what that deal ought to be. And then we say, all right, but you don't tell anyone what your share is. And then we go to the next NOC, and you try and make sure that you can fit all the NOCs in, in that allocation. Uh, another startup problem, of course, was the United States. Highly developed market. Um, very good uh, sponsorship programs of its own. Persuading them to come in to the program was, was very difficult. And the outcome was that the United States Olympic Committee got as much out of the program as all of the other national Olympic committees in the world combined. And we tested that by saying, uh, well, uh, the US, they're pretty good about that. They said, 
why don't we leave all this to you and we'll just do our own? And they said, no, 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 <laughs> we need the United States as, as part of the program. So that'll change over time, but that's been uh, a, uh, a difficult issue. Management that program, we first used an agency, ISL. Uh, then we, uh, as, as it started to drift off uh, focus, we, uh, we had our own in-house agency that we paid for, but uh, the, the talent uh, was outside and now we've taken it completely in-house. Uh, we have to manage the working conditions for the media. As I mentioned, 99% of the world experiences the Olympics through television or some uh, variation of that, uh, as well as the written uh, press. So you've got to provide them with working conditions that enable them to get their stories out as quickly and as effectively as they can, which means you've got to provide space for them, you've got to give them access to the, the, all the data, the stories, the results uh, on an instantaneous uh, basis. And that, uh, that we're, we're pretty good at that. Um, the biggest difficulty with the, the, the written media is are the, the so-called reporters from around the world. I mean, the, the news agencies, the Reuters and so on, you, they're all pros and you know what they're, they're going to do and you know what they need. But there are a whole bunch of folks that show up as tourist stroke journalists and they're asking for accreditation and, and the organizing committee doesn't really know whether Joe Smith is a bona fide reporter. So we punt that back to the National Olympic Committees of the various countries and say, look, you have 45 accreditations. Let us know who they are. And that way you, you avoid some of the, uh, uh, the, the sport uh, germ journalism. I've talked about uh, the broadcasting and um, Olympic broadcasting services. Uh, let me go on to reputational risk. Uh, that is something that uh, is particularly important. As uh, most of you will know, we got into a, uh, a problem in this area with respect to the Salt Lake City decision for the 2002 Games. And uh, while nothing criminal was ever alleged with respect to the uh, IOC members, uh, it was clear to us at least and, and to the public that they had been acting unacceptably and, and had uh, seriously compromised our reputation. So we took that very seriously. Uh, you know, you can't be asking for high level behavior on the part of your athletes and, and everyone else and not practice what you're preaching. So. Uh, it happened that, uh, that uh, I was failed once again to avoid eye contact, so I got stuck heading up that uh, investigation. And, and very quickly, we had a, were in a position to uh, expel or, or force the resignation of about 10 of our uh, members. And we followed up on that by, by suspending visits to the candidate cities, by putting into a, uh, effect a, a code of ethics, creating an independent ethics commission publishing our uh, financial statements, audited financial statements with international standards, uh, opening up our, our sessions to the public and to the media and, and a whole raft of other uh, reforms, including uh, term limits and uh, uh, adding Olympic athletes uh, as a class of member um, in, in the IOC and uh, a, generally a screening process to try and eliminate uh, possible uh, undesirable uh, members. And so we had, a, it was a, a difficult uh, few years, but I think now if you're out there looking at, at good governance, especially in the international field and, and sport organizations, we're probably the, uh, the, the gold standard. There's a far more serious problem going on with FIFA, as all of you will know. And, uh, but the difference between our situation in FIFA is, is the actions that are alleged uh, are, are criminal actions. The United States is trying to extradite a whole bunch of these uh, people uh, to be tried for you know bribery, corruption, money laundering. This is really uh, serious. And I, I must say that thus far, at least to me, and I'm I'm a little removed from it, that they, FIFA has shown no particular ability to deal with. You you have a 
president who was just elected and who, in the middle of all this, four days later he announces that he's going to resign. He hasn't resigned. And, and I think a lot of people missed the intervening step. Uh, what's going to, how that's going to play out, I don't know, but uh, I, uh, I can assure you it will not be a straight line from A to B. And, and among other things, it, it's, uh, it's not inconceivable that uh, the awarding of a couple of their big events, like their Olympic Games, uh, the World Cup, have been seriously compromised by some of these activities. And, and if they're so tainted with fraud, you, know, you have to consider the possibility that uh, they may be uh, reallocated. And, and governance obviously has to change. So if you're comparing this you know, for disasters, um, uh, FIFA is kind of the Exxon Valdez compared to the IOC's Tylenol, you know, admit it, do what you have to do and, and, and move on instead of fighting every uh, step of the way. Now here's one, I'm, I'm trying, am I running out of time? All right. what, uh, a, a, an emerging management problem uh, for, for us and it, and it applies to every sport as well, but in relation to big games is, comes from the, the changes in the way that sports events and many other aspects of modern society uh, are perceived by a viewing public. Uh, sports organizations, as we all know, are, are notorious for being change resistant. And what may, may be fascinating for the small, dedicated group of people in, in a particular sport uh, can be incomprehensible to a non-expert uh, viewer. Uh, games and matches often take far too long uh, to uh, be completed, um, longer than most spectators today are willing to absorb. Um, and, and, you know, dependence on television and so on requires that events be scheduled, start on time, and finish at a, within a, a certain uh, broadcast period. And probably the greatest uh, risk that uh, is that audiences find the event or the sport to be boring, in which case they just don't even bother watching. And if you're in, in a sport that's it's subject to that and you depend on viewing public or people with their thumbs in chairs at your events, that's a big problem because that can, uh, you know, if you wrap yourself in the cloak of tradition and so on, it may turn out to be a shroud and uh, you'll disappear from the, uh, from the scene. Uh, because the metrics for measurement are available now and uh, the market-driven outcomes can be brutal indeed. You know, an in, in international rugby tournament takes 30 days to play. It's like the World Cup. Uh, a cricket match, some days you don't know how long it's going to take to finish. Um, and, you know, sailing's all but impossible for a non-sailor to understand and watching a whole bunch of people with, with bows shooting arrows at butts, TT, butts, uh, is really not very exciting. So a lot of uh, sports have really had to, um, to adjust and, you know, sailing got rid of some of the big classes, put in lacers and, and uh, you know, sailboarding so that you don't have to be a wealthy uh, person to, to enjoy and participate in, in sailing. Uh, rugby has developed rugby sevens. In fact, that's going to be on the program for the first time in uh, Rio. Uh, I think it's going to be a huge success. Uh, I, the first time I saw a tournament as opposed to a game was at the Youth Olympic Games in Nanjing uh, last summer. And you, you can schedule matches reliably 30 minutes apart and see uh, the whole exciting game in the, in the meantime. So I think that's going to be a, 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 a big hit. Um, archery's got, uh, they've gone to this mano a mano format where you're, where you're actually, it's, uh, you're, you're shooting a targets against somebody. And you shoot and you hit a bell like a chess clock and your opponent has 30 seconds or something like that to, to do the same thing. Or, and, it's um, actually quite an exciting uh, sport now. So the, the message here is that, that all sports have to be alert uh, to the new society and the changes that that brings and the, and the potentially seriously adverse uh, impacts on them. Uh, from our point of view, is, is, uh, we, we, the, the management is to, issue is to ensure that uh, sports at risk 
particularly Olympic risk uh, in our event, uh, both understand that there is risk and that those who fail or refuse to evolve may disappear from the Olympic uh, program. They may disappear altogether. We had, as I mentioned, uh, we were committed to review the program uh, after each uh, Games. Uh, recently, the, that review has been somewhat perfunctory um, because it's been taken hostage by the international federations who declared that 25 of the 28 sports we were then dealing with are core sports for the Olympic Games. Uh, and that's a declaration that is manifestly wrong. But there they are. So that you can fiddle with three sports out there on the edge, uh, but none of the other self-declared ones. And I hope that our new leadership will, uh, will change that and make it a little more uh, uh, vigorous. Uh, because in the long run, we depend on getting that particular mix uh, right. Just as, as, a, as a footnote, you might be interested, when did we did that first assessment in 2005 after uh, Athens and eliminated softball and baseball, the International Federations instantly closed rank and, and insisted that the results be kept secret. I'm a voter. I don't even know what we got. Some notary in darkest Switzerland has the voting list and, and you, if you're baseball or not, let's say if you're field hockey, you can go to the notary and the notary will tell you how many votes you got, but nothing else. And, and I think the, the reason is probably that the international federations didn't want anyone, perhaps especially their sponsors, to know how close they may have come to elimination. And I suspect that there would have been many surprises on the part of sports which confidently declared themselves as core uh, sports on the program. And the other management issue here is, is we've got to uh, continue to encourage the in introduction of new events uh, that may relate better to a younger uh, audience. Uh, this, my view at least, this should not amount to complete capitulation to the uh, flavor of the month and the, the transient interests of youth. But it should be a recognition that, that, that someone who relates early to the Olympic Games is far more likely to maintain some kind of a connection with them uh, than somebody that you're trying to attract uh, at a later stage in life. So it, it, it's easier to maintain an existing connection than, than it is to try and make a new one. So you've got, you know, the half pipes, the aerials, trampoline, those are uh, even the, the modern uh, uh, Olympic version of triathlon are all examples of trying to appeal to a, a more disparate audience. Ongoing issues, and I'll be uh, uh, finished in a moment. Uh, they include sustainability, uh, which we've heard uh, a certain amount today, and best practices, uh, good governance. These are these are issues that uh, not only are current but but are are real and and important. Uh, certainly, since the the Lillehammer Games in uh, 1994, uh, the IOC has been committed to sustainable development and in fact has made uh, the environment one of the uh, pillars of the Olympic movement. Uh, in addition to commitments to this sustainable development, uh, our host city contracts, which are getting thicker and thicker every year, now include provisions regarding best governance uh, on the part of the organizing committees and regular reports on their compliance with anti-corruption uh, legislation. We've added new language to the Charter regarding discrimination uh, on the basis of uh, sexual orientation, which arose, as many of you will remember, from the, uh, uh, the Russian legislation uh, prior to Sochi. Uh, increased uh, involvement uh, of women in the organization of sport. Where, you know, we're getting not far from a 50-50 representation on the field of play, um, but we're, we're way behind in the uh, organization. That has been a, you know, mandated now, and, and concrete steps have already been taken in the, the recent announcement of the IOC commissions for uh, 2015. Uh, maintaining productive relationships with government authorities. Again, we had some presentations on that. Uh, it's important establishing the legitimate 
expectations of governments and sports authorities uh, is a matter of increasing importance to both sides of that particular equation. So by way of conclusion, I, I think it's fair to say that big games can be managed. Uh, in fact, they've already uh, been managed. But critical to the ongoing management is, is to be alert to potential changes, to encourage them where appropriate, uh, to maintain an appropriate uh, autonomy uh, when necessary, and to ensure that there is, instead of confrontation, uh, enlightened dialogue at all times. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation. Maybe just a few questions and then it will be up to Boya. Um, yep. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you, you had mentioned about uh, the, the Bit City uh, visits being curtailed, uh, but I want your views. Uh, with respect to new geographies or new countries now wanting to bid for the games and the, the games are going global, wouldn't it be of an advantage if you had a certain window which allowed members to visit these cities so that they know what they're bidding for, so it gives, it gives them an opportunity to present themselves? Well, it, it, it's, we're trying to balance the, 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 the possible appearance of, of inappropriate behavior with the difficulties for some cities, the, the people, I mean, everybody knows Paris. Uh, ask Chicago what they think about there being no visits to Chicago. Uh, so there is, there's some downside to it, but uh, the way we've tried to deal with that is twofold. One is to have an evaluation commission that actually does its job and, and makes recommendations about the risks involved with, uh, and the rewards involved with the various cities in, in the competition. And secondly, and we've just gone through that with the 2022 candidates, invite them to Lausanne for special presentations, uh, to, and the IOC members uh, are invited as well, uh, on day one, and then have a day two in the, hospital, in the hotel where you can actually go and visit their little setup and meet the, uh, the people on a more informal basis to discuss what's going on. And I would say for the foreseeable future, that's probably the way we're going to do it. And, and I think the, fa the fact that we're now in a, in a more collaborative relationship with the candidate cities, that combination, I hope, will, will get us to the, the state of awareness that we need and keep people out of potential trouble. I had a question on uh, Olympic revenues. Um, I've heard uh, some organizing committees uh, complaining that they were not getting uh, enough of uh, these uh, Olympic revenues, uh, especially their share was decreasing from uh, every four years. So uh, what, what's your feeling about this? I think that has been the, um, the case ever since the IOC had any revenues to share. Um, I think the the uh, organizing committees are getting quite a good share. I mean, they're, they're getting, they get the 90 some odd percent of the ticket revenues, they get uh, all of their national sponsorship revenues, they get uh, roughly half of the um, top program. They're doing pretty well. I mean, they, they in fact ought to be able to, to, to meet all of the Olympic costs overlay in organization and so forth out of the, the non-tax-based revenues that they receive. Um, and one of the things we've done with Olympic Broadcast Services is, is because we have the expertise to do that, we can do it much cheaper than they can because they would be doing it for the first time and they would have far more concerns about redundancy and, and their contractual exposure to broadcasters who laid out millions of dollars and, and you know, it's a catastrophic failure if that signal doesn't get out. So I think they save money and they save risk uh, by that, all of which could be, it could be quantified if you had to. No, I think they do very well. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you.